Hey guys, welcome back. So this is part two of my October 25th, 2020 flea market finds. I mentioned in part one that there was one item that I was going to uh, hold off on showing because I wanted to dedicate a uh, entire video to this one item. I was going to make it a surprise, but I wanted to put the information in the title so that other people who might be curious about this type of uh, telescope uh, would be able to find it. So I'm going to get this thing set up on the bench, turn the camera around, and we're going to talk about what led me to believe that I was going to actually be able to do something with this thing and then explain why I'm not going to be able to do much with it and also what I ended up learning along the way because I knew nothing about telescopes. I still do not know much, but I know enough now to know when it's time to walk away. All right, guys. So this is my... Mead LX200 EMC telescope. Um, I was at the flea market and I saw this thing probably, I don't know, earlier in the morning. I went by that dealer again later. I bought that Cobra CB radio that I showed in part one of this pick. And then uh, this thing was still sitting there. And then I went by again later on and... Um, I don't know what made me ask about it. I think I had ignored it off the bat just because, you know, my first quick observation of it was, my thought was it's going to be crazy expensive. The thing is, this guy does clean outs and stuff like that. So he probably got this thing for next to nothing, um, which is good. <laughs> so when it fam finally came down to it, and I guess he didn't have any takers on it throughout the day, um... I was able to score this thing for dirt cheap. I'm going to actually hold off on letting you know how much I paid for this thing. Let me tell you a little bit about it, okay? All right, so some of this stuff I got off on Wikipedia, so I'm not sure how accurate it is, so bear with me. But it uh, looks like Mead was founded in 1972. And uh, then in 1980, they is when they the year that they first got into making the Schmidt Cassegrain type of telescope. Uh, I had originally thought that Schmidt Cassegrain was the manufacturer of the lens, what I was calling the lens, which I was wrong on that too. Um, and we'll get to that in a bit. So Schmidt Cassegrain is a type of design of telescope it's a type of telescope that allows you to get a very long, I think it's a long focal length in a short tube. So by using some hocus pocus and mumbo jumbo. So anyways, that's when they first started making them. And then uh, in 1992, they launched the family, the LX200 family of commercial telescopes. This is actually considered a commercial grade scope, which means that back in the day this sold for thousands of dollars. They made different sizes. This one is a 12 inch. Uh, I think they made them down to 8 inch and then I think they made one all the way up to 16 inch. You can imagine. And then there were different versions over the years uh, that had to do with coatings. Apparently EMC has something to do with the name of the, uh, the type of coating that's on the lenses or something. I don't know. Anywho, Mead was making telescopes here in the United States uh, and moved around a couple different locations and they ended up in Irvine, California and they were making scopes until 2009 when they moved all of their production to a plant in Mexico. In 2013, they merged with a Chinese company called Ningbo Sunny. So Ningbo Sunny became the Chinese parent company of Mead. And about a year ago, or a little over a year ago, uh, there was a major decision in a, I think it was an antitrust suit that was brought by Celestron Telescopes against Mead and its parent company and accused Mead of conspiring, I guess, with another manufacturer, I forgot who, uh, 
in trying to uh, fix prices in the U.S. on telescopes. And they were awarded something like $16.8 million in damages or something like that, which led them to file bankruptcy in the earlier part of this year, from what I had read in the article. And it's basically bankrupt bankruptcy protection because they now are on the hook, I guess, for this money, but the, they claim that they're going to still, you know, they're not going anywhere. They're going to still somehow survive this and come out of it. So let's get back to the telescope. So why was I able, why, why was this thing sitting there all day and hadn't been sold? Was it because the guy was asking way too much money for it? No. The reason why is because there is a big dent right here in this, which is actually a nice metal cover. It's a nice, this lens cap, <laughs> again, it's not really a lens, it is actually metal. And the dirty little secret that it's hiding that scared everybody away who, who may have gotten serious enough to actually look into it is this. So this is all smashed. A big crack in the top here too. So this thing is uh, not too good. There's a whole chunk of the glass missing here. I could stick my hand right into this thing. So why did I buy it? Well, here's what I figured. I figured I'm Mr. Fix-It. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find one of these lenses on eBay and buy it. I mean, how expensive could it be? And then I'm going to just take, look, it's got screws. Clearly, you just unscrew this thing and you take this out and you pop the new lens in and Bob's your uncle. Wrong answer. <laughs> oh, and by the way, this being all busted is not the only issue with this scope. There's also some pieces missing. And I didn't even know what the names of those pieces were before. Now I know. And again, I just thought, I'm going to find one of these here on eBay and another one here on eBay and I'm just going to put this thing together and I'm going to get myself this really cool scope and it's going to, everything's going to be wonderful. Well, okay, so, all right. So let's talk about this, this tube right here with the optics in it, okay? Is what's referred to as an optical tube assembly. Pretty fancy name, right? Kind of makes sense. It's a tube, it's got the optics in it and it's assembled. Optical tube assembly. The way that this telescope works is the light comes in through this part right here and it goes down and it hits a mirror that's way down inside there and the mirror is concave it's got a dish shape to it very precise and that mirror actually makes the light beams reflect back up and hit another little mirror on the back of this disc right in the center right here. And it hits it so precisely and at just the right angle so that then the light is reflected right straight down the very middle of this big huge tube. So you get a whole lot of light coming in here reflected back up into a fine little cone that hits here and then is then reflected in a straight line right straight down the middle of this tube and right out the back. Right straight out this hole right here. And then what mounts on here is, I forgot what they call it, but there's a, there's a doohickey that mounts on here that allows you to attach something called a star diagonal. And the star diagonal uh, looks like a, a cube sliced right in half and it's got a little tube on it that goes in here and then it's got a little tube on it that comes out here that an eyepiece goes into because you're not going to do this I mean I guess you could but it's not really practical because this thing's facing up at the sky right so the idea is it's facing up that way and you're looking in from the side right so the star diagonal has a prism in it and it basically makes the light that's coming straight down this tube that we were just talking about, makes it make a 90 degree turn and go into the eyepiece and into your eyeball. Uh, apparently there's also, uh, I don't know if they still call it a star diagonal or not, but there's another device you can put on here that does the same thing, but it has a mirror in it. And I guess there are certain reasons why you might want to use a mirror one instead or not, or one's superior than the other, or one's cheaper than the other, I don't know. 
like I said, don't want to get too technical with this thing, but you get the gist of it. So I'm missing a part that screws on here, which can be changed, I guess, so you can put cameras and stuff on it. Um, the star diagonal, which there's plenty of those around. That's an easy thing to find and not terribly expensive. An eyepiece, again, not too, too bad. I don't have to go. I mean, it's, the sky's the limit. It's like anything else. If you want to pay enough money, you can get really expensive on this stuff. But I could have found probably cheap enough replacements for all of this stuff in the back here, and it wouldn't have been too, too bad. This right here, okay, is a mount for a little miniature telescope that's called a finder scope. I was calling it a spotting scope because it reminded me of a spotting scope you would, you would use for shooting. So to spot your targets. So it's called a finder scope. And the idea is it has a much larger field of view and it helps you uh, center this big telescope on an object and then you switch over after you've, you've lined it up, you switch over to the, the eyepiece here to get the really good look at whatever it is that you're, you'll, you, you centered, right? That makes sense. So I was going to need to find one of these. And again, I could probably find one that not, wasn't too, too prohibitively expensive that I could replace this with. So that wasn't a big deal. The next problem was the electronic controller down here. Well, actually, let me get to that in a moment. While I got the camera positioned looking at this thing, let's talk about the other big issue. You see this hole right here where it looks like maybe something broke out of? Right here. All right. There was a doohickey that came off of the back of here. It was mounted to here. This thing must have fallen off of a tripod. That's my theory as to what happened to this thing. And when it took its spill, not only did it break that glass up in the front, but it also busted off whatever was right here. The nearest I can figure from what I've been able to research is the device here is called a focuser or something along those lines. And what it would have been is it could have been either manual or it may have even been electronic or a combination of the two. It might have been like a, almost like a servo. But what it does is that mirror that's inside there, that huge mirror, it actually has the ability to slide up and down inside that tube. In fact, if I tilt this back up, probably not a great idea, but I've done it so many times now and I'm sure a thousand other people have too, did you hear it? It just slid down. <laughs> and it probably shouldn't be slamming like that, but the gist of it is there'd be something that's stuck down inside here. I'm actually touching the back of the mirror now. I could push on it. Touch the back of that mirror or the mount that the mirror's on, whatever. And it would probably have like almost like a micrometer threaded deal on it. So very precisely, you could adjust that. Okay, so I could have probably made something to replace that or found another one to replace it. So that wasn't really the deal breaker. It was more of a, it was more of the issue that it turns out because of the precise alignment of the optics in this, that you really can't replace that glass in the front. You can't just take that glass out. Even if you can find another one, if you put it in there, it's not gonna match up correctly. You're gonna have some sort of issues. In other words, any of the optics inside this optical tube assembly, um, if they need to be replaced, it's pretty much a non-starter. The only thing that really is possibly usable on this thing is the mount. So the idea is, the advice I got was, well, you know, get rid of this, get another one of these whole assemblies and put it in this mount. Well, by the time I pay for another one of these and put it in this mount, well, then it begs the question, why the heck even bother? I don't have a tripod for this mount, okay? It would have had a tripod to sit on. I mean, I guess I could put it on a tabletop or something like that, but that's just asking for trouble, I would think. And then that brings me to the other issue with this thing. Oops. Careful, you might break it. 
So one of the reasons why these telescopes are so god-awful expensive is because of the technical mumbo-jumbo that goes on in the bases, what they call the mount. So I think this part right here is called the fork. But it turns out it's really actually an integral part of this base right here. You'll notice this says right on it, Mead LX200. And what it says is it says computer drive system, LX Quartz DC servo motor, smart drive. And it's got a uh, little uh, meter over here to show you the current draw. It's got a little level here to show you when it's leveled. It's got an on off power switch. It's got a north south switch. It's got a a uh, few cable hookups here, okay? Uh, they look almost like telephone. They're not, well, they might be, that one might be, what do you call it, J511 or whatever? So that says deck motor. I'm going to assume that's declination motor. Uh, CCD, that's charge coupled device. That's interesting. Maybe that's what that is. Power. 18 VDC, so that means your power inputs here, 18 volts DC. Um, keypad, reticle, focuser, RS-232, and auxiliary, okay? So, declination motor. I think that simply is a cable that went from here right over to here on the uh, fork. Yeah, it says declination motor right there. So that's this motor up here on the on the side of the arm. It's out of frame right now. And that is responsible for making this thing tilt like this. All right, okay. Uh, CCD, have no idea. Power, no power supply anywhere to be found. I even looked through all the other boxes and stuff that he, he had had laying there. He had all kinds of junk from, how, from some houses he cleaned out and everything. Couldn't find any of the other parts. Keypad. Would have been a pretty fancy looking doohickey, kind of like, well, this is a microphone, but, you know, a thing you would hold in your hand, a dongle or whatever like this that would have uh, all kinds of buttons and everything to do all kinds of fancy stuff to basically manually control this thing. Because there's, you know, a motor in here that rotates it left and right, and then you get the declination motor, all of that, right? But then you could also, I think, put in, like, coordinates. Crazy. Um... Reticle, don't know what that is. I think that has something to do with like the eyepiece deal. Focuser, probably that was for if you had where this big hole is busted out here, that thing I was talking about, if you had an electric focuser, you would pl probably plug it into there. RS-232, that would be so that you can hook this up to a computer and use the computer and software on the computer, special software, to actually use a computer to control this and do stuff. So that's interesting. And then aux for auxiliary, who knows? So I found a Facebook page dedicated to LX200 Mead telescopes, classic LX200s. Apparently this is considered a classic. Uh, classic, I think, is the unofficial name that was given to it by fans of the scope. Um, as opposed to I guess this was replaced by the LX200 GPS, which added, obviously it must have been global positioning satellite technology, was now available to be used to basically, GPS would tell this scope, I guess, where it was positioned on the face of the Earth to help it locate celestial objects. Pretty cool, right? So a little while ago I said that this tube right here is this optical tube assembly is basically junk if you break anything in it. Well it turns out apparently like the mirror inside here isn't completely, uh, if it's not broken or damaged, it's not completely useless. It can be maybe used for another project or some other type of, uh, you know, telescope build maybe. I don't know. I think somebody had mentioned that. So I might be able to get a little something out of this uh, as far as, you know, selling the parts so i figured well that's what i'm going to do right i'm going to part this thing out so i started to wonder about this base well it turns out that the fork and this base is con considered the mount and apparently these mounts some guys really want them so i got contacted by somebody who saw that i had this broken telescope and uh 
they said that they'd like to buy the mount from me. And they threw out a price of like 300 bucks. And I was like, wow. I said, that's pretty good. And I ended up communicating with that person only to find out, unfortunately, that they were in Canada. I actually had somebody else even, I forget what they were, Australia or something like that, said, oh, they wish they could get them out from me, but they knew that the shipping would be crazy. So this guy's in Canada. Well, shipping from the USA to Canada is a pain in the butt for me. I've never had much luck with it. And you can see this thing's huge. Even when you take this, obviously the tube wouldn't go. It would just take the mount. But just because of the physical size of it, you've got to box it up. And then you got to cushion it enough so it's going to be able to get there safely. You end up with a huge box. You end up with uh, the customs paperwork and all that baloney and everything. Then I also got contacted by another guy. And he offered me 500 for it. And he's in New York. He's one state away. Now, I think he's like five hours away. <laughs> Drive time. But still, it really got me thinking about this thing. But then I realized, well, here's my problem. Nobody should be paying three to $500 for a used mount like this that could possibly be a complete piece of junk. This thing could be trash. I have no way of knowing. So um, what I'm hoping to do tonight is I'm hoping to rig up a power supply and see if I can put any power to this thing. They might even be a possibility that this thing might even move on its own without any control pad hooked up to it. I don't know. Uh, I think I read somewhere that this controller might go through a almost like a handshake process uh, with the controller, but that if it doesn't, sense the controller that it might actually uh, actuate the servos and go to almost like a, a home position or something. I don't know. So figure what the heck. If I can get a little bit of life out of this, I can at least get a little bit closer to the mystery of whether or not this thing is complete junk or not. And that way I can let the guys know that are interested in this thing that, hey, you know, there's a little bit of life coming out of it. So uh, I'm going to leave the optical tube assembly on here for the time being because I do want to see whether or not uh, it does try to uh, do the, uh, what do you call it, declination and elevation thing. So, oh, there's also a knob here, uh, which is, I guess, a manual declination knob because when I turn it, it's definitely doing this up and down. So there's a motor inside here, but what I'm not liking is this knob is bent. The shaft that this knob is on is bent, so it does not turn on its own axes correctly. And there's a weird deal going on here that this whole knob moves in and out kind of loose, which doesn't seem right. And if I pull it out loose, I can hear it actually is not, it's like it's, it's the teeth are slipping. It's not engaging correctly. So there's something going on inside here. I think there's damage to this servo or the drive or whatever, which is not good. All right, so here's what I've got. I've got a 13 volt power supply, DC. I can't find a, anything bigger uh, that has, I can't find anything bigger that has this type of jack on it that's gonna fit in here. The other thing I gotta be concerned about is polarity. Well. I think I'm pretty safe at assuming that the center pin is positive and that the outer jacket is negative. I think it's pretty safe to say that it's going to be uh, the center pin positive, which this power supply I checked already and the center pin is positive. Well, that's a good sign. It's doing something. All right, so this isn't a digital readout. It's a little bar meter. To show me the current draw and it sounds like a motor is running actually I think I just I think I just noticed this just turned okay so it stopped now it's almost as if it's like sitting in an idle position I'll try this north south switch that doesn't seem to do anything I'm gonna turn it off and do it again Yeah, I can see right here. It's moving. 
So I don't know if this is degrees or what, but there's a 14 here and then there's quite a few divisions to 15. And it appears like every time I turn it on, after powering it off, it moves a very precise amount of divisions. It moved one and a half divisions, but then it almost sounds like the motor's still running, but this has stopped. Yep, same thing. Moves the same distance every time I turn it on, and then makes that noise for a little bit longer after it's stopped. It doesn't seem like it's getting stuck and like there's a clutch slipping. It almost seems like it's this is stopping on purpose and then the motor continues to run. Almost as if there's like some kind of clutch or something that maybe electronically is engaged and disengaged. I don't know. So I wonder why they keep running the motor after it reaches whatever position it is. So that's all it seems to want to do is move a, move one and a half. Now, the declination motor is not doing anything, but I think that's because I don't have a cable hooked up to here. So let me just see whether or not a regular network cable will plug into that. <laughs> the only one I have handy is this really long one. Uh, this is my uh, son made this at school in information technology class. Turned them, they showed him how to crimp network cables. I also don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming they tested this cable after they had the kids do it. I don't know. All right, let's see what happens. All right. Let me just go find a known good cable just to make sure that that's not what we're dealing with here. All right, I now have what should be a known good cable. It uh, actually was brand new and used. Probably got it with a router or something and didn't end up using it. Yeah, so I, I don't know what to make of that. I can't make it send any signal to the declination motor to do anything. You know, if I had a keypad, I could plug it in and just manually try and actuate it, but... Without that, I don't think there's much more I can do testing-wise. 